mode. Hello everyone. Good evening and welcome to our webinar. This is the second installment of our six-part series for advisors. Part one given last week is available on our website at equinicity.com if you missed it. I'd like to introduce our presenter this evening, Mr. Bruce Raymond Wright. Bruce is the co-founder of Equinicity Resources. He's an author, mentor, teacher and entrepreneur and for over 25 years he has been helping advisors and their clients in their quest to attract and sustain meaningful relationships with affluent and discerning clientele. Welcome Bruce. Thank you Taruni. Very nice to be here. Well we have a lot of ground to cover and we have uh, a topic that is um, uh, I think very exciting to me and uh, I think obviously the people that have um, decided to join the webinar tonight must have found it interesting or they wouldn't be here. So thank you to everybody for investing your time with us this evening. And uh, my plan is to get through the presentation in a timely fashion so that we have room for questions and answers at the end. So our title tonight is Innovative Business Strategies, Tactics and Tools for Top Advisors. And we're just going to jump right into this. Um, when asked the secret to his success, Wayne Gretzky, the great hockey player, responded, a good hockey player plays where the puck is. A great hockey player plays where the puck is going to be. And maybe that's one of the differences between good and great. The good are focused on um, what's happening um, right now, and they're not necessarily able or willing to think about what's going to be happening next and to sort of arrive there before the puck arrives. On this next slide, I decided to quote a famous author and business consultant, Peter Drucker. He said, the future belongs to those who create it. And that is, to a very large degree, the essence of what we're going to be talking about this evening. So the context is creating a new and better future uh, as an advisor for yourself, but it's also about taking that concept uh, directly to uh, the people that you want to do, to do business with and the uh, people that do business with people that you want to do business with. And we'll get more into that as we, as we move through the content uh, this evening. It is unlikely that you will outthink the current economy or your typical competitors by thinking, reacting, and behaving like most people. Uh, I hear the term, this is on the next slide, Taruni, um, the term uh, most people, I hear it, it's just, I hear it everywhere. Well, most people this and most people that, and uh, the, the reality of it is I think that hmm, People who are exceptional, people who perform at an exceptional level, people who deliver exceptional results, really don't think like most people. They don't act like most people. And this is probably why they're able to do exceptional things. And uh, for those of you who are wondering uh, about uh, any of these slides that we're uh, using this evening, if you'd like permission to use them with your clients, uh, just send us a permission request and we'll respond to you right away. Um, so when we're thinking about this idea of getting to a new level and being something more than uh, average, ordinary, or even how do we become more exceptional than top advisors, people who are really at the top of the game, how do we uh, separate ourselves even from them. And that's what we're going to be focusing on tonight. On the next slide, I want to talk about um, adversity and uh, resistance. So as soon as you let average people know that you are thinking and acting differently from them, you will encounter resistance. I could have said adversity, but resistance is just a more polite way of putting it, I think. Um, it's one of the fundamental challenges for anybody that wants to uh, break apart from the herd and be seen as different or special. Um, as soon as you make it known that you want to be or do something special, 
you're going to find a whole bunch of people who want you to stay right where you are because wherever you are right now is comfortable for some people. And those people who find the current condition comfortable are going to offer resistance to the change. Some of them will be very upfront and vocal about it, and others will be uh, what psychologists like to call passive-aggressive, where they will act passive or even act as though they're supportive, when in reality they're opposed to where you're going and what you're doing, and they will sabotage your efforts. Uh, these people come in all shapes, sizes, colors, religions, conditions, and many of them are people who love you the most. Our own parents, our own siblings, our good friends, um, our colleagues, uh, people in leadership uh, within uh, our businesses, uh, peers, uh, will offer substantial resistance as soon as they think you're going in a direction that they don't understand, they don't agree with, they're not comfortable with, what have you. They will become resistant to it and they'll offer a whole series of uh, comments and ideas that will um, that are supposed to be uh, in reference to your well-being and in reality are really all about you staying in a place that is comfortable for them to have you in. They want you in that place that you're in right now. That's where they're comfortable and they really don't want you moving to a different or higher plane. There's an old uh, saying, and I don't know who said it first, but I think it applies here. You are where you are comfortable. So as soon as you decide to get outside of your comfort zone and become something special, uh, you're going to find resistance from the people who want to stay in that comfort zone. And there's another old saying that uh, I don't know the originator of. Um, and it goes something like this. People want you to do well. Some of them want you to do really well. But very few people want you to do better than them. So when you really think about that, um, there is a human tendency to try to um, contain uh, growth at some comfortable level. And uh, when we perceive somebody going at a more rapid pace, it can elicit fear inside of us because we think, oh my gosh, this person's going to surpass me. This person's going to outperform me. And it is really a, a great challenge to be sure and something that we're bound to encounter if we choose to be innovative and productive in ways that are beyond the standards of normalcy or average. Uh, on the next slide, I've got this uh, fabulous little illustration which is commonly known as the yin and the yang. So if you think about it as opposing forces, not necessarily that one is good or that one is evil, although that is one way to characterize it. Um, one of the ways of looking at it is that for every action there's a reaction. There's many uh, interpretations of this, but this symbol is internationally recognized as the yin and the yang or the opposing forces. And um, I think it's a great visual for uh, what we're talking about this evening. On the next slide, exceptional people always encounter resistance from people who think and act in average ways. Now notice that um, one of the things you'll discover about a lot of my writing and speaking is that I very rarely will use absolutes. However, there are certain things that are a matter of fact or a matter of nature, if you will. And this is one of those things. So for example, I can speak in absolutes that here on planet Earth, if I hold a pencil three inches above my desktop and I let go of the pencil, I can predict with absolute certainty that this pencil is going to hit the desk. It's going to fall and hit the desk. I can predict that with a sense of absolute certainty. Uh, however, I'm willing to concede that should some very strange occurrence take place, like a nuclear explosion blows me up just as I'm releasing the pencil, the force of that could blow the pencil up into this, a ceiling tile and it could stick in up there. But barring some kind of freak uh, situation like that, um, there are some absolutes which make sense. And this is one of them. 
uh, exceptional people always, not some of the time, but always encounter resistance from people who think and act in average ways. It's been that way since the beginning of uh, time uh, or the beginning of human existence, and it appears as though human beings really haven't evolved very much in the last 3,500 years or so. And this is why um, we see so much of the same behavior being repeated today uh, that was prevalent in the times of ancient Greece um, and, uh, and even before that. So this is something that's been with us for a long time. It's something that's going to be a part of our lives as we move forward. And the question is whether we're going to be adult enough, mature enough, strong enough, brave enough, and bold enough to accept that this is a fact of life and just move on and become uh, exceptional irrespective of the resistance uh, or the adversity that we're going to encounter. On the next uh, slide, uh, innovative and competitive advantages begin with new awareness or the vision to either perceive something that is invisible to others or to see a new application for something commonly perceived by others. And I realize that this is a really long sentence as I, as I see it in front of me right now. I feel almost like this is worthy of an Ayn Rand book. It's such a long sentence. Innovation and competitive advantages begin with new awareness or the vision to either perceive something that is invisible to others or to see a new application for something commonly perceived by others. So I'm putting it in two categories. Innovation, category number one. You see something that no one else sees, you take action on it, and you become an innovator. Uh, option number two, you see something that is commonly available to everybody else, but you imagine or you envision some new application, some new use, some new methodology that you can attach to this commonly available thing, and uh, an innovation is created. One could argue that um, one is a derivative work, or the second one is a derivative work, and the first one is about um, the creation of something truly new. And my point is, <clears throat> my point is this: sometimes it doesn't really matter whether you create something that's absolutely new, or whether you just simply find a new, or better, or different application for something that's commonly available. What does matter, however, for the sake of our conversation today is that this is really about innovating and being perceived as somebody who is special and different and brings a new consciousness and a new way of being, a new level of thought uh, to the discussion with the kinds of clients that top advisors want. So when we're talking uh, to clients who are, in effect, more discerning and generally more affluent, more experienced, and hopefully wiser than average, uh, it's very important that if you want to connect with them, that they perceive you as being special and that you're bringing something that is profoundly important into their lives or into their businesses or into their finances. And to the extent that you can be a person who brings this new level of consciousness and uh, making the invisible visible for them, uh, the more valuable you become. So on to the next slide. I've got a question here for everybody who either already is a top advisor or who uh, wants to be a top advisor. So this is a which would you choose type of question. Uh, one, you can see what is now invisible to almost everyone else. I put almost everyone else because um, I have a theory about uh, innovation and creativity uh, and the inspiration that sort of spurs this type of thinking and awareness. Uh, and I know it's going to sound a little metaphysical and a little ethereal, but uh, my theory is that when God or the universe wants humankind to have some kind of a new way of thinking about things or a, uh, a step up in the evolutionary process, um, a burst of inspiration is sent uh, to the earth. And um, those people who are tuned in on the right wavelength are going to pick up 
that inspiration. To a person who writes rap music, the inspiration is going to look, feel, sound different than a person who writes country music. Uh, and then again, it's going to sound, look, and feel different to somebody who writes opera, and it's going to look, feel, and sound different to a novelist who tends to use um, human history as a background uh, versus a novelist who is using sort of current events as the background. And then there's a science fiction writer who gets the same burst of energy and interprets it in some type of futuristic scientific way uh, or science fiction way. And, um, so it's the same burst of inspiration, but we hear it a little differently, we perceive it differently based upon our frame of consciousness, our frame of mind, our state of awareness, and what our talents are, how we interpret it, how we apply it. Um, so let's just say that at a moment in time, that burst of, of inspiration hits. Some people are sleeping, some people are starting their morning, some people are in the middle of the day, some people are um, you know, sitting there watching television, uh, they could be doing anything when it comes of the millions of people who are uh, tuned in enough to receive the burst of inf inspiration. Uh, only a small fraction of them will do anything productive with that burst of inspiration. So let's say maybe we switch the word from productive to meaningful or something that you can do to capture that uh, inspiration and create something meaningful with it. So uh, it really helps to write it down, as an example. But if you're a musician, you might not just get up out of bed at 3 in the morning and write it down on the pad. You might get up, sit down at a piano or a guitar, or whatever your instrument is, and begin composing based upon this burst of inspiration, this music that's in your head and the lyrics that are in your head. <clears throat> Excuse me. So. Uh, of, you know, for every one person who gets out of bed at three in the morning and captures this burst of inspiration in some salient way and begins to do something productive with it, there's probably a thousand people who uh, receive that burst of inspiration and they take no action whatsoever. It comes into their brain, goes out of their brain, they forget about it almost as soon as, as it came in, and um, those people miss out on the opportunity that was made available to them because they're simply not ready to take action with it. So um, I think that's uh, to a large degree how inspiration works. I don't want to make this webinar all about inspiration. I could probably spend two hours just on this one subject. But I um, think it's important that when you receive a burst of inspiration or when you begin to see now what is invisible to almost everyone else, that you capture it you retain it, you, you make it transferable, and the best way to do that is to write it down, give yourself a voice memo, or do something physical to capture it in a physical way so that you can hold on to it, you can play with it, you can nurture it, you can sculpt it, and you can mold it into something that is useful and beneficial to you and to humanity uh, in, in some way that makes a difference. Um, and again, if you capture that inspiration and you only use it for yourself, that could be a positive thing. But if you want it to be commercially viable, you have to figure out how to package it so it's interesting and compelling and valuable to other people. Option number two here is to create a new application for something commonly available. So those are the first two choices. And the third one is to think and act very similarly to just about everyone else and pretend that you are special or unique. I deal with this on a very uh, consistent basis. Uh, almost every day somebody asks me if I will introduce my clients to them. Now, my typical response is to be friendly with them and then I, I want to know uh, specifically why would my clients want to meet you. See, I understand why people want to meet my clients. But my clients, in order to agree to have the meeting, my clients need to know why are we having this meeting, what is this about, and how does this matter to me. So if the person requesting the meeting can't express himself or herself in a clear, articulate way that matters to my clients, there's simply no reason to set the meeting up. 
And the truth is, uh, what I encounter the vast majority of the time is people who are thinking and acting in very similar ways to just about everybody else in their niche, and they're telling themselves that they're special and unique, or maybe somebody in their life is telling them how special or unique they are, when in truth, they're neither special nor unique. And uh, for people who sometimes think that my view on this is harsh, I'd like to point out the definition of the word unique. Unique means that you are the first of your kind or that you're the only one of your kind. So if you work for Merrill Lynch and you say that you offer a unique service to your clients, um, unless you work for some special secret, just newly rolled out division at Merrill Lynch, then your perception that you're doing something that's special and unique is delusional. So I know this, and so does anybody with an ounce of discernment. So it doesn't do uh, anybody uh, any good to live in a state of delusion and to think that we're more special or unique than we actually are. So I'm willing to concede that on a spiritual level, each one of us is unique uh, and is a unique spiritual entity and I'm willing to concede that fingerprints can be unique. Um, but if you really want me to believe that you're unique and special, I need to see some tangible evidence that proves that you're special or unique, and most people just simply uh, can't do that. So um, those are the three options, and you get to decide, you get to pick. Are you gonna choose option number one, option number two, and option number three? That's uh, entirely up to you. And um, if you're looking for a profound competitive advantage and you really, really want to get to a new level and be interesting and compelling and attractive to discerning affluent clients and the various advisors that surround them, then I'm going to suggest that options one or option number two are better uh, for you and they improve your probability of success exponentially over option number three. On the next slide, we'll talk about this idea of unique products uh, for just a moment. Um, I will admit that there are, on occasion, unique, first-of-a-kind, relevant products that come into any type of field of endeavor. Whether we're talking about a software uh, product or whether we're talking about a, um, a technological application or a device, um, or whether we're talking about some type of financial uh, product that is a package of uh, you know, different types of investments or what have you, a uh, package of features, advantages, and benefits, if you will. So uh, certainly unique products can exist, um, and they can always be unique in, in the way that they are the first of their kind. However, if a unique product is even marginally successful, it will be copied uh, almost uh, overnight. Certainly this is true in the financial services world. Um, literally within a matter of days, that product is going to be on the drawing board at seven or eight or 10 or 20 or 50 different competitors, and they're all going to be figuring out how to create some derivative of that unique product. So the, the sense of it being special and um, uniquely available at the firm that invented it um, goes away very, very quickly. So then we bring up this idea of uncommon wisdom. So I'm not talking about you know classic common wisdom like look both ways before you cross the street or measure twice, cut once. Those are sort of basic forms of wisdom, uh, which are generally sound uh, to live by. But what about uncommon wisdom? You know, where do we find wisdom that people are unlikely to discover for themselves? And why is it important for us as advisors to do that? Um, I'll give you an example. Just today, I was dealing with one of my clients who is a brilliant surgeon. Um, but he's certainly uh, challenged when it comes to the specifics of uh, managing his financial affairs. And um, he seems to find 
um, uh, new ways with amazing regularity to bite himself on the butt. And just think of that visual for a minute, biting yourself on the butt. That's kind of a hard thing to do. But this guy figures out new ways to do it on a consistent basis. So um, if you want a less um, graphic, let's use biting himself on the neck. And that will work too. So it's hard to bite yourself on the neck. And um, this guy has a talent for it. So um, he put himself into a huge degree of complexity. And uh, I've assembled, or in the process of assembling a team, to essentially bail him out of some of the mistakes that he's made. And um, he feels a little bit overwhelmed by it. So I, I sent him a little, uh, little message. And I said to him in the message, remember the words of Carl, uh, remember the words of Carl Jung, uh, J-U-N-G, um, who's a very famous uh, psychologist. He said, we don't solve our problems, we outgrow them. And in that moment, it was exactly what my client needed to hear. And he sent me back an email and he said, wow, this is exactly what I needed. Um, yeah, and because, you know, I keep making the same mistakes over and over again. So in order to stop this, I've got to outgrow the thinking and the behaviors that, you know, keep producing these kinds of outcomes. So um, now Carl Jung's quote is commonly available virtually everywhere. But in that moment for that particular client, that was perceived as uncommon wisdom. And the thing that really made it uncommon wasn't that the Carl Jung quotes aren't readily available to everybody. It was just that in the frame of mind that he was in at that moment, it was uncommonly valuable to him. So uh, please understand that sometimes it's about taking what is common wisdom, making it available at the right time, at the right place, for the right person, and then it becomes uncommonly valuable to them in that moment. When you learn how to do that as an advisor, um, you can separate yourself from the rest of the herd who are going to use language like, well, I'm here to help you solve your problems. You know, we need to solve these problems. We need to solve these problems. Well, if you're dealing with somebody who's operating at a higher level of consciousness and awareness about human psychology and human behavior, you know, a long time ago, they came to the realization that you're not going to solve these problems unless you outgrow them. So uh, if you're running around using language that positions you as a bit of a Neanderthal, uh, you're going to self-eliminate from being a purveyor of wisdom, a conduit of wisdom, a um, special advisor to exceptionally discerning people. Because if their level of consciousness is more evolved than yours, then they don't perceive that you're going to be able to bring them some kind of uh, you know, new and inspiring wisdom. So on to the next slide. So uh, uncommon wisdom has been commonly available in writing since the advent of written language. The question is this, will you choose to be a conduit or will you surrender that role to a competitor? I believe this is one of the most important questions that any advisor in any field of endeavor needs to ask themselves. Am I going to be the conduit for uncommon wisdom or am I going to surrender that role to a competitor? I believe that when the student is ready, the teacher appears. I'm sure all of you have heard that phrase before. Um, I had the great uh, pleasure this um, starting at 12 midnight on Saturday to go through the preparation of my first colonoscopy. So I got to drink um, this wonderful concoction which just cleaned everything out of my system and I couldn't eat anything from uh, midnight Saturday until I completed the procedure uh, which was yesterday at around uh, noon. And I did not feel like eating anything for, <laughs> for the next few hours. But um, 
I can tell you that on Sunday when I was when I was able to be in front of a television, which I spent a lot of time in another room in the house, but when I was able to watch television, um, I, I believe that I saw something in the neighborhood of 376 uh, food-related commercials. Now, normally, I'm relatively oblivious to food-related commercials because I very rarely get to the point of being really, really hungry. So I discovered that uh, the hungrier I became, uh, the more interesting these food commercials would be. And I literally had to change the channel uh, quickly because I didn't want to torture myself. So um, awareness uh, can be piqued by a number of things. A person who is not readily susceptible to McDonald's commercials, I put myself in that category. I'm just generally not a fan of the McDonald's offerings. But I got to tell you that that commercial for the Big Mac was really attractive on Sunday evening at about 8 p.m. So uh, as our circumstances change, we become more open to and more interested in uh, things that maybe yesterday or a month ago or a year ago were not interesting to us at all. So a person who isn't particularly ready for uncommon wisdom or looking for a conduit for uncommon wisdom uh, can become interested. Um, and when they do, this is how the universe is built, when a person becomes aware that they need a source of wisdom in their life, there is a high degree of certainty, if not an absolute certainty, that um, candidates will begin to show up. And then the seeker of wisdom will choose a conduit uh, for wisdom. And uh, the question is whether you're going to want that person being chosen to be you, or whether you're going to surrender that role to a competitor. On the next slide, I want to make a really important point here. A lot of people stress themselves out because they think that they have to become the original source uh, for the wisdom. Um, I don't believe that's true uh, for me at all. And while it is true that I originate a lot of content that some people uh, believe is wise and insightful, um, and I appreciate that perception. I, I might at times question the judgment of those people. But um, it's nice to have an audience, and it's nice to have people who who see me as a, you know, a creator of wisdom and insight. Uh, but I will say that um, almost everything that I think up, I soon find out that somebody already stole that idea from me a thousand years ago. Somebody who's been dead for a thousand years came up with that idea. I think I just discovered an idea and I'm onto something new and exciting and powerful and amazing and compelling. And a whole bunch of people agree and they think it's really great and we're able to work together and everybody's able to move forward and, and be more uh, abundant and more effective in their lives and businesses. Um, and then, you know, somewhere, someplace, somebody points out to me that Socrates or Aristotle or uh, Eucrates or somebody someplace somewhere, um, you know, was was making that observation or something, you know, reasonably close to it, um, you know, a thousand or two thousand or three thousand years ago. Um, so um, I think it's uh, important to understand that uh, it doesn't really matter that much to most people if it matters to anybody at all whether you're the original source of this timely, insightful wisdom, or whether you are uh, a conduit for somebody else's I ideas. So to finish the slide, it says you do not have to be an original source. Discerning people will be very happy with you, even if you are merely an effective conduit. So um, rather than feeling intimidated and thinking, oh my gosh, you know, how am I going to come up with this stuff? Um, there's an alternative, which is to become a seeker of common wisdom and uncommon wisdom, and maybe any and all kinds of wisdom. Become a seeker uh, of those things. Um, 
and be on the lookout for them and you'll find them. You'll find these nuggets of wisdom and you'll find a whole variety of sources that are available to you and, and quite frankly they're available to everybody else. Um, but if you get in there and you discover these things and you begin to talk about them intelligently and explain them to people, uh, you're going to experience uh, a repositioning uh, or a new position as to how people perceive you uh, in the future. And um, it is very important that, um, that I think you do that if, if you want to be uh, a person who takes charge of that rather than, sur rather than surrendering that role to a competitor. Um, on the next slide, let's take a look at um, a turning point in my life. Uh, when I was a young man, uh, probably early 20s, I was in the financial services business and um, I had a fairly decent mustache, but it was only fairly decent. And I had a full head of hair and I looked like I was younger than I really was. So I might have been 24, 25 years old, but I could pass for... 18, 19 if I wanted to. So uh, I started really thinking about this idea of how am I going to establish credibility with people who have uh, any money at all and any discernment at all because I mean let's be blunt about it if all you've done is get through sort of the basic financial planning courses and the training offered by financial services companies and you're in your early to mid 20s the simple truth of the matter is um, there's really nothing special about what you're going to be offering. The products you're going to offer are going to be available everywhere. They're commodities and, um, and you don't have a whole lot of life experience and you probably don't have a whole lot of wisdom when you're 24, 25 years old. So why would anybody in their right mind do business with you when they could connect with somebody who is substantially um, uh, more experienced and has more wisdom uh, than you do. And this was a, a dilemma, particularly uh, for those of us who looked younger than we actually were. So um, I stumbled across this uh, quote by Oliver Wendell Holmes, man's mind, once stretched by a new idea, never regains its original dimension. Just think about that for a minute. If you can stretch a person's mind, if you can take them someplace new, someplace they've never been before, you stretch their mind and it never regains its original dimension. Very, very insightful quote. So I contemplated this long and hard and I began to uh, see a path for myself where I could find wisdom and, and interesting ideas and I could start talking to my clients about them. So if I knew that I was having a meeting with somebody, uh, for example, a lot of my clients, how crazy is this, right? So I'm in my mid-twenties and I, I land a corporate client, uh, the Lockheed organization, and the Lockheed organization is uh, an aerospace firm and a whole bunch of my clients are literally rocket scientists and uh, physicists and metaphysicists. I mean these are some really really brilliant very technically oriented people. So I started to invest myself in the study of um, uh, aeronautics and ballistics and um, a variety of things that this group of people would find to be interesting and compelling. And I started talking to them about it, and mostly just like asking them questions about things. But I would say, oh, I was reading an article uh, in such and such a magazine, and um, you know what said this, and um, I was wondering what you think about it. And then they would talk to me about it. Just the very nature of the fact that I was asking them questions about things that were relevant in their careers and um, at an elevated level of consciousness 
in terms of their industry or their profession. Even though I wasn't the originator of the idea, I certainly didn't write the article that I was quoting. I couldn't have written it if my life depended on it. Um, but I began to really connect up with these people in some tremendously powerful and significant ways. And um, this led to uh, one of my very first paid speaking engagements uh, was for the National Association of Aeronautics and Astronautics. And I think I was 25 years old. I might have been 26 years old at the time. And um, I'm standing in front of uh, a couple hundred um, physicists and rocket scientists. And, you know, I'm in my mid-20s. And I'm there to talk to them about uh, finances. And it's interesting that in my experience dealing with these folks as clients, they were very, very analytical and very detail-oriented, so much so that if I gave them a prospectus, they would go through the prospectus, they would read every single word in it, they would get into the financial projections, they would create their own original spreadsheets, and they would start to build um, their own software and their own algorithms to test the math that was in the prospectus. And 100% of the time, without fail, they discovered discrepancies. And then, of course, they would want me to explain the discrepancies, which, of course, I couldn't explain. So then I found myself getting um, the people on the phone that had generated those numbers and creating conference calls, etc. So I was doing um, extra things to improve the understanding of the clients, and I got a reputation for really caring about the details and really caring about um, the importance of how those details mattered and why they mattered to the clients. And that uh, gave, you know, basically caused me to get referrals to uh, additional numbers of um, uh, aerospace related people. So it was a great learning ground for me and it really taught me the incredible importance and value of uh, having um, these, uh, you know, wise resources, which I didn't originate, but that I could get access to, and then I could integrate uh, this wisdom and these observations and these nuances into my um, relationships uh, with my clients. So, classic example: when I started off, I certainly wasn't the originator of any wisdom whatsoever. I was a conduit and that's it. So um, with that said, let's move on to the next slide. Um, so I want to talk about some actual tactics that you can use. And those of you uh, who are familiar with my work know that I am uh, uh, a whole brain person. I can't help myself. I was literally born this way. And um, it seems to me that I am incapable of staying in one hemisphere for very long because when I spend a bunch of time in the right hemisphere, uh, like we've done so far uh, in the context of this webinar, now we got to get into the tactical, pragmatic application of things. To me, that is just really, really important. So um, let's talk about actual tactics, things that you can do. Item number one. Stretch the imagination, the possibilities, the vision, the joy, <clears throat> excuse me, the fulfillment and the sense of significance for all of your clients, prospects, referral sources, colleagues, readers, listeners, viewers, etc. What I'm suggesting to you is the, the primary tactic. If you look at it as a start off with the strategy, the strategy is to be the conduit uh, for uncommon and common wisdom. That's the strategy. The tactic is to actually stretch their imagination. You're actually going to do it. You're actually going to engage them in these meaningful conversations. Help them get to a new level. Help them see possibilities they never would have seen on their own. Help them to create a vision that is more clear and more powerful than anything they would have created on their own. Help them co to connect that vision to a sense of joy, a sense of fulfillment, a sense of significance that is really, truly relevant to them. That's the tactic. And don't just do it for a few people, do it for all of them. 
Do it for all of your clients, all of your prospective clients, all of your referral sources, all of your colleagues, all of your readers, all of your listeners, all of your viewers. Do that for everybody. And um, when you do that consistently for everybody, you take on a whole new persona. You actually become this type of a person. You actually make the transformation from being somebody who thinks this is a neat idea to living in a state of being where you are actually a conduit for common and uncommon wisdom for everybody around you. So that's the tactic number one. Let's move to the next slide, please. <clears throat> Item number two is clarity. One of the things that I discovered was uh, prevalent amongst uh, the people that I encountered, still true today, uh, most people are struggling with clarity. They can give you a general idea about certain things, but when it comes right down to it, they lack clarity. And I can tell you this, when you lack clarity, about something, it's a lot harder to commit to doing that something. When you have clarity, you can become substantially more committed and more courageous. And at the end of the day, advisors, at least the top advisors, the ones who are looking to achieve really significant outcomes, understand that clarity, confidence, courage, go hand in hand, and without them, it's unlikely you're going to get anything significant accomplished. Item number three, one of the tactics is to be kind. Kindness goes a long, long ways towards creating credibility, enhancing credibility, creating trust, enhancing trust, and positioning you as a reliable and valuable resource. If you have all the wisdom in the world, but you're unkind about it, um, this can be very off-putting and disturbing to people. And uh, being blunt, if they don't like you, uh, it's going to be really, really hard for them to work with you. So uh, be kind. Item number four, listen more, sell less, solve more, be more helpful. Now, this is a little bit of a trick in here. Uh, and um, and it's the word solve. Because I want to go back to the Carl Jung saying, we don't solve our problems, we outgrow them. So within the financial services world, you can self-sabotage as simply as putting the word solve into your PowerPoints or having it in your dialogue with people because as soon as you're, you're talking about solving more problems, again, you create distance between yourself and the client who is operating in a high level of awareness where they realize you don't solve problems, you outgrow them. So uh, as sort of a homework assignment, I would ask each of you to contemplate how would you phrase item number four here without using the word solve. And go ahead and write it out <clears throat> and um, give yourself the opportunity to seek and to be in alignment with divine inspiration. Uh, get into the mode of practicing this idea of becoming a conduit for divine inspiration or to be a creative source of wisdom or a co-creator with source of wisdom is another way to look at it. So take a look at that word solve and try to figure out how you could write that down in a way where you wouldn't be using that word. And uh, you know, if I tell you the answer, um, I'm denying you the important growing cathartic experience of figuring some of the stuff out on your own so that you can become excellent at it. The more I do for you and the less you do for yourself, the less excellent you become. So there's a certain amount of this work that I'm able and willing to do on your behalf, but at the end of the day, for you to really step into this elite realm of advanced level top advisor, it's about you stepping up and becoming exceptional in your own right, where you can do this without being dependent upon me uh, or, or any other uh, source other than divine source. Let's move to the next slide, please. 
Um, item number five, no coercion. I see people constantly coercing and using coercion as a means for furthering a relationship. The problem is that coercion won't work with discerning people. It will separate you from discerning people. It won't make you more attractive to them. So you've got to rid your business model, your thinking process, and your behavioral model of any coercion. <clears throat> Excuse me, I have a bit of an allergy problem going on. Um, the next one is force. And this may seem a little bit unusual in terms of uh, thinking about being a top advisor. But let's think about this idea of force for just a minute. Can you think of any circumstance where anybody who's acting as an advisor becomes forceful or intimidating in order to get a client to do something that they probably wouldn't do on their own or if they had enough time to think about it? Number seven, no condescension. Instead of being condescending and taking the attitude, hey, you know, this is my profession, I know how to do this, I know more than you, get in, sit down, hold on, and shut up, uh, and I'll take you for a ride exactly where you want to go. Instead of using this condescension, condescension model with coercion uh, and or force involved, let's move to item number eight, which is to educate and elevate. If you position yourself as one who educates and elevates the people around you, not just your clients, but colleagues and referral sources and, and everybody, if you become a source of education and elevation for everybody, then you move into the state of being of authentically being a conduit for uh, wisdom. Some tools that you can use on the next slide, please. Um, how about a whole new attitude? Assuming a new attitude of being a teacher, a conduit, an innovator, instead of a transactional salesperson. Uh, item number two, writings from you and or others who are conduits or originators of uncommon wisdom. More tools on the next slide. Videos. These can be videos that you've created. They can be videos that other people have created. I can tell you that one of my favorite videos to use is a movie called Groundhog Day. And I have all of my clients watch it, even if they say, oh, I've seen that movie before. I want you to watch it again, and we're going to talk about it because it's absolutely relevant to where you're going next. And sometimes they just think I'm nuts. But, you know, the different homework assignments I can give people, it's one of the more pleasant ones to sit there and watch that movie. But to really be paying attention to what is going on in that movie and then when we talk about it, um, I want to talk about where you saw yourself in the movie and what were some of the new ideas that you got from watching that movie. And you can learn to use videos, movies, um, created by other people that may have had a totally different intended purpose, uh, but you can, uh, in effect, create a new context for them and use them in ways that are um, educational and elevating uh, for the people that you're connected to. Item number four, receptions and book signings. I'm a big fan of um, getting uh, authors uh, into author receptions and book signings uh, and putting uh, them in front of my clients, people that have new uh, or challenging ideas, uh, innovative perceptions, and um, the ability to help people see something new that they wouldn't see on their own. And, um, uh, I become uh, a source for connection to new original ideas and thinking. And again, I'm not writing all those books. I'm not creating all of that content. But I can make that content available to my clients in ways that educates them and elevates them. Uh, retreats, um, webinars, and social media. Now you'll uh, please note that missing from this list is the word seminars. Uh, there's a reason for that. Um, discerning, affluent, A-level clients very rarely, if ever, go to seminars. However, they do go to author receptions and book signings, and they do go to retreats, and they do go to symposiums, but they very rarely, if ever, go to seminars. So I don't do seminars. I don't speak at seminars. Um, I do speak at author receptions and book signings. I speak at retreats, and I speak at symposiums. But I don't do seminars, 
and I want to make sure you understand that there's a little hint of sarcasm in what I'm saying right now. Um, so these are tools that you can use. Obviously, social media and webinars are a combination of uh, content or intellectual property and technology, but they're still tools um, using technology for the distribution. Let's go to the next slide. Innovation occurs when you get to the future ahead of everyone else. Uh, Taruni and I were just talking about this the other day, and it prompted me to write this. You know, how do you know when innovation is actually happening? Hello. It's when you get someplace new and you get there ahead of everybody else. That's how I define real innovation. So this is my definition of what innovation is. And in effect, by looking at it, you can also tell what innovation isn't. So um, I would like to uh, go to the next slide. We've got some upcoming events. We've got a uh, American Merger and Acquisition Association conference that we're collaborating uh, with on January 17th or 19th in Las Vegas. Anybody who's interested in learning about exit strategy planning for successful business people should familiarize themselves with the AM and AA and um, become a member and start attending their, their programs. I did a webinar with the founder of that organization, Mike Nall, N-A-L-L, -L, last Friday. And it's my understanding that that webinar will be available on the Equinicity website uh, within the next um, 72 hours or so. Um, there's a macro strategic planning one-day event, February 17th in Marina Del Rey. And that's for uh, business owners and also advisors who want to learn more about that process. On the next slide, we've got some other upcoming events. March 15th, we're doing a Business Innovation 2012 Symposium, uh, subtitle is Growing Your Business in Turbulent Times. We've got some amazing speakers um, who are whole brain people who get dynamic execution in the real world, and they'll be uh, teaching at that conference. And then we're doing a macro strategic planning certification and licensing course, which will be uh, in June. Uh, for phase one and phase two will be in September. And the next slide is how to get, get connected uh, with us to uh, gain access to the wisdom and insight that we make available on our website and Twitter, etc. Um, and with that said, I'd like to open this up to questions. And since I don't know how to do that, I'm going to have uh, Taruni do that right now. Yes, if anyone has any questions, you'll see in your control panel uh, that there are a few icons. There's a little hand icon. If you'd like to ask a question, uh, you can just click on there. Uh, I see that Eric would like to ask a question. So Eric, I'm just going to unmute you so you can go ahead and um, ask your question to Bruce. Go ahead, please. Hello, Eric. Hello, Eric, are you there? If you're, if you're not able to speak, if perhaps you don't have a microphone, Eric, you can um, type your question into the chat box. Okay, while Eric is doing that, if anybody else has a question, I'd be happy to uh, answer. Okay, well listen, if we can't get to the questions tonight for technological reasons, you're welcome to send me an email at bright at equinicity.com and I promise that I will respond to that email within 24 hours. Um, and if you'd like to talk to me uh, on the phone, call my office at 805-527-7516 and uh, my staff will set up a conference call for us. You can call the, uh, the toll-free number, which is 855-809-9006. And I really want you to know that I appreciate the time that you've invested here with uh, us this evening, and it's an honor to have this opportunity to present this information to you. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you very much, Bruce, and thank you, everyone, for taking the time to join us this evening. Um, I see that we did actually receive Eric's question, uh, which was, what are the first two tools? Um, 
do you want to answer that, Bruce, or I know that you had them well, on the slide? It's a, few, it's a few slides back. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't, I mean, let's just go back a few slides real quick and see if we can pull that up. Uh, okay. um, so there you go, right there. So uh, tool number one is a new attitude, a new perception about yourself is another way of saying it. Perceive yourself differently to perceive yourself as a teacher, a conduit, and innovator instead of a financial advisor or instead of a software developer or instead of a paper salesman or instead of a transactional lawyer. Um, so it's about transcending your current vision of who you are and what you do and why you do it. So that's, the, that's I think, number one. And then number two is writings, either writings that you create or writings that other people create. So, um, you know, just like I did when I was young and didn't personally have any, uh, or at least didn't have any significant amount of wisdom to, to bring to bear in my relationships with people, um, I sought it out and um, I found it. It's very interesting that as I became known for being a source of wisdom, uh, clients and colleagues started sending me books and um, videos and back in those days they were uh, they couldn't decide between Sony and Beta but um, uh, so, uh, Sony Beta and VHS I'm sorry um, who started sending me um, uh, cassette tapes and uh, all, all kinds of uh, media that contained wisdom and they, you know send a note with it that say something in the effect of hey I thought you'd really find this interesting um, you know, you're a source for this kind of stuff, but maybe there's something in here that you can use. So it's really interesting that even though I didn't ask anybody to send me wisdom that they thought was valuable, um, people did it anyway. So now I ask people, if you come across anything that you think is particularly wise and insightful and helpful, um, share it with me. Uh, and, uh, and people do. It's really cool. So um, once people become aware that you're not arrogant and you don't think you know everything and that you're um, a uh, eternal student, which is how I view myself, um, they'll come across really cool stuff and they'll send it to you. And uh, it's one of the really interesting perks of being perceived in that role. So anyway, thank you everybody for joining us today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Bruce. We'll talk to you next week. The right. presentation and the audio recording will be available on our website uh, within the next 48 hours. We hope that you'll join us for the remaining four parts of this series. You can sign up for each of them on our website. Just look under the Upcoming Events tab. Thank you, everyone. Good night.